Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. We are doing that and today we have a lot of people who are helping us put that together. Let me tell you that Corey is one of them. Corey, what are you doing today? Today we're gonna to be looking at some ancient cultures surrounding the time period of the Exodus and seeing some of their law codes. Very good, and you have studied as well today. Yes. What did you come up with? We focused on Exodus chapter 16 today, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about trusting God. Exodus chapter 16, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna to talk to Ryan about the things that he has studied, Ryan. Well, today we're exploring a mystery of the Bible that's been right under our noses. Right under our noses. This is also fascinating, and also today, in just a moment, we're going to study this. God handles the feeding of his people. And the people are complaining and all of that. Well, God deals with that. And we'll talk about that coming up in just a moment. Right now, let's get ready for Corey. First today in our historical studies, you and I are going to be taking a look at an ancient law code. It comes from a civilization around the time period of Abraham. So this is well before the time period of the Exodus, and we're going to put it into some context and see what it means for biblical studies. After years of frenzied battles, the city kingdoms of ancient Mesopotamia began to take on empire-like forms. Around 1800 BC, when an Elamite chieftain won possession of four important cities of the south. In northern Mesopotamia, the king of Assur also spread his reach out to form an early version of the empire of Assyria. While these two empires were flexing their military muscles, between them, in middle Mesopotamia, a man named Hammurabi inherited the throne of the city of Babylon. Situated in between these two powers, Hammurabi began building his forces, striking allegiances and preparing for years of battle that would eventually see him king over the first rise of the Babylonian Empire. Hammurabi launched his takeover of Mesopotamia by creating alliances with powers that would help him gain more territory before he would turn and defeat them too. His first major alliance was with Assyria while he defeated the south. Then, with the city of Mari, while well, he defeated Assyria, until with his empire grown, he commanded to have power over Mari as well. When King Zimri Lim of Mari refused, he defeated it and set it on fire. Once Hammurabi had established his Babylonian empire, he created his law code known as the Code of Hammurabi. It's known from its one surviving copy found in ancient Susa. This copy holds the title of the most complete ancient law code known. To create an atmosphere of collective compliance to the so-called supreme authority of Hammurabi, and to try to strengthen his right to rule by claiming divine favor from the God of Justice, a copy of these rules was carved and posted in every main overtaken city. Regardless, Hammurabi had to fight to keep a hold of territory until his death. Laws can be written, laws can claim, or even be divinely ordained. But where laws exist, history shows, so does rebellion. What a study of ancient law codes really does and enables for biblical studies is it gives some foils, a backdrop of culture uh, up against which to compare and contrast the law that's given to Moses for the Israelites. Now, I've heard this concept uh, used in a very strange way to combat the, the historical accuracy of the law of God. A lot of people have said to me uh, or said in general, and I've heard their argumentation that uh, because there was law codes that are existing and because there are similarities between these law codes, between the content, not the laws themselves, but what the laws pertain to and the Bible, it proves that the Bible is dependent on these law codes 
or that somehow, because these law codes existed before the book of Exodus and, and Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers were written, that somehow that is a knock against the historicity of the Bible. But that's just not the case. No one is saying here, or we shouldn't be saying, that God's law written in the books of Moses was the first law ever to exist. We know that's not true. Uh, the real benefit of knowing about these laws is it shows us how God was changing the culture of the Israelites. Now, remember also more broadly, there was a law of God before this law given to Moses. We don't know what it was, but it must have been there because how else would Noah or Enoch, for example, have known how to live their lives? It's hard to change the way we have lived for years. Now, when the people of Israel became a nation, they lived for several hundred years in Egypt amidst all of their gods and rituals. They are comfortable with Egypt and its religion, and they know the ways of the Egyptians. They know their customs. They know their peoples. God changes all of that. The Israelites don't know how to act and react in the wilderness. Instead of seeing their plight as a change in culture and doctrine, they complain. Now, this is a new reality for Israel. They get out of Egypt, but Egypt doesn't really leave them. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 12. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord, but what are we that you complain against us? Also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. It's important for us to understand and to enjoy the scripture as we read it. Now I say enjoy for a very good reason, because we can enjoy reading it, but at the time Israel was going through it, 
A lot of it wasn't exciting. It was up and down and all around. And Israel was trying to let Egypt go because they had lived there for 400 years. And this is absolutely fascinating. Now, if you don't have the Bible guide, why not? You should write to us and send an offering in any amount or go to the website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com and go there and make a donation any amount and we'll be happy to send it to you. But our steps of faith are important. As we look at this, we need to say and explain that it's hard to change forever. It's hard to change forever because a lot of people think that once you are like you are and young, you grow up and you get to a place where you live like you want to, well, you don't change. But in the case of Israel, there were people different ages and they did change and it was hard for them. Our reading is Exodus 16 to 18. And as we read that, you need to pay attention. Our looking and our exploring is in Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. And as we look at this, let us consider what God says to us. We go to Exodus 16, 1 through 5. It says, And Israel journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. And then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. By the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. That's amazing. When we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to fulfill or to be full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. That's what they were saying. Verse 4 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in. And it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. I find that amazing. And as we look at this, we learn that God handles the feeding of his people. We must learn to trust God and not ourselves. This is so important. The people had come out of Egypt and they had said, well, you know, we're used to eating from Pharaoh giving us food, but now Pharaoh's not around and God is giving them food, bread from heaven actually. And this is absolutely stunning. And so God says, I will feed my people. And you know, he says that to us today. When we think, well, you know, we've got to make a paycheck or we've got to do this or we've got to do that. Who is it that gives you the intelligence to think about what you're doing at work to make the money? It is God Almighty. And even the governments know that. And it's important for us to realize God is our source, the God of the Bible. Now that's important as we continue on. We learn in Exodus chapter 16, verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Also, Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but they are against the Lord. Moses is trying to get the people to understand. God establishes the fact that when the people complain against Moses and Aaron, they are really complaining against him. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I need to tell you something, that when we complain and when we are concerned about all the things that are happening, and we've done everything that we can do, we need to understand that we give ourselves to God. It is God who makes the way for us, God who makes a place for us, God who messages people and tells people and God, if we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ, and if we have said, Lord, you are my Lord, and I take you as my Lord, and, and confined our lives to his will, then God will take care of us. 
And I need to tell you that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and, and you know that, then I want to remind you today that be encouraged. God will supply your needs. Whatever they are, no matter who's done what to you, God will supply your needs. Stay in touch with God Almighty. We go to Exodus chapter 16, verses 9 to 12. It says, Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know, you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Which brings me to the last point. God reveals that he feeds us. And it's not, and, and we eat because of his graciousness. It's not because of ourselves. And that's something we need to remember today. You and I are going to continue to study ancient law codes. Now, these are not biblical law codes, but they're from cultures surrounding the biblical culture. We're going to be able to compare and contrast God's law that we find in the Old Testament. The ancient city of Mari flourished from around 3100 BC till its destruction by Hammurabi of Babylon in 1760 BC. In biblical chronology, this means from the early time period after the flood of Noah until after the time of Abraham, probably a few generations into the Egyptian captivity. After accidentally being rediscovered in modern times, the site of ancient Mari was extensively excavated. Mari was located in a center of ancient power and was advantageously built at the junction of several major trade routes. Its importance is displayed through the archaeological discoveries made there. Massive walls, temples, palaces, and public buildings. But by far, the most valuable discoveries at Mari have been from its golden age, encompassing the last 25 years before the city's destruction by Babylon. It's from this time period that the massive palace of King Zimri Lim has been found, containing 300 rooms on its main floor and another estimated 300 from a second floor. So well constructed was this palace that after more than 3,000 years, some of its door lintels were still intact. The most stunning find of the palace is what discoverers have deemed the Royal Archive, over 25,000 documents. These ancient letters shed light on the language, culture, practices, and advancements from the period of the biblical patriarchs. There are legal, religious, civil, and even personal letters between the king, his wife, and daughters. Besides creating a cultural backdrop on which to display the scriptural history of Abraham, the Mari archives verify biblical forms of covenant, animal sacrifice, and the existence of certain personal, city, and pagan god names. The Mari archives also contain prophetic literature, male and female prophets corresponding with the kings of Mari. What this does is gives historic documentation to the early importance of prophets. Quick Study Television has teamed up with Creation Ministries International to bring to you four DVDs that will deepen your understanding of Christianity's foundations. Genesis and the Gospel Connection demonstrates Genesis' direct link to Jesus and explores creation as it affects the Christian faith. Genesis, the missing piece of the puzzle, explores modern issues that have stunted the growth of Christianity in modern times. Codes in Creation presents a surprising case in the creation evolution debate, casting clear doubt on modern scientific conventions. What the Bible and science say about the age of the earth tackles the question of the earth's age, challenging both secular and Christian positions. 
We are pleased to offer these DVDs individually for a donation of $15 or more per DVD, or order the bundle of all four for a donation of $45 or more. Write or call and ask for yours today. Thank you for staying with us and joining us here on Quick Study Television. We're taking you through the Bible. And if you're not going through the Bible, why not? You should join us. About 15 minutes of reading a day, 20 minutes of mm -hmm. reading a day. It is an excellent idea to go through the Bible. Now, I need to tell you next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be talking about this. God set specific conditions for worshiping Him. He did. And we have to worship Him certain ways. The Ten Commandments tell us that. We'll be talking about that and more on the next Quick Study Television program. Ryan is here. Ryan, what'd you study? Well, I know our reading today is in Exodus, but I want to go back to the fifth chapter of Genesis because there's an absolutely fascinating mystery that's been right under our noses. Now, Genesis 5 is a genealogy, which means a lot of people just skim over it or skip it altogether. But it's here which lies a most curious mystery. Let's explore. Some mysteries of the Bible are hidden in plain sight, such as the case for Genesis chapter 5. In this passage, a genealogical record of the family of Adam, ten Hebrew names are presented. These are proper names, however, so they are not translated, but only transliterated to approximate the way they were pronounced. This leads us to question what these names signify in English, an investigation which requires the study of the original roots. The very first name and man of the human race, Adam or Adama, fittingly means man. Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 reveals that Adam begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and that he named him Seth. Seth means appointed, as Eve explains in Genesis 4.25. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Seth's son was Enosh, meaning mortal or frail, while Enosh's son, Kenan, can mean sorrow, dirge, or elegy. Kenan's son, Mahalalel, means the blessed God, and Mahalalel's son, Jared, means shall come down, from the verb, Yarad. Jared was the father of Enoch, Enoch meaning teaching or commencement. The name of Enoch's son was Methuselah, which comes from two roots, Muth meaning death and Shalak meaning to send forth or to bring. So Methuselah means his death shall bring. Methuselah's son was Lamech, meaning lamentation or despairing. And Lamech named his son Noah, derived from Nechem, which as he himself explains in Genesis 5.29, means to bring relief or comfort. And he, Lamech, called his name Noah, saying this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Assembling these name meanings in sequence reveals a hidden message. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. That is remarkable. It is God's entire plan for redemption, the gospel, presented right here in only the fifth chapter of the Bible. The implications of this discovery are deep and are many, not the least of which is the fact that right here in Genesis chapter 5, God already had a plan in place for our redemption, which was to send Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to earth to die on our behalf on a wooden cross. Remember, every passage that's in the Bible is put there by design. 66 books, 40 authors. It's literally all interweaved. Let's not miss a single word of it. That's really interesting, and I can't remember how many times I've read those names, the first 10 names, and not know what they not mean. Know. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Anyway, thank you, Ryan. You studied yeah. today. What'd you do? Well, yes, I did. We're taking a look at Exodus 16, and in this chapter, we see how God has made provision even to give the Israelites, his chosen people, food every day. He's sending bread from heaven. And with that, he is giving them specific instructions 
for how to gather and eat that food. One out of five days, they're to gather just enough food for that day. And if any food is left over, they're to throw it away. They're not to keep it until the next day. Well, you know, human nature, sometimes we think, well, that's not very frugal. I've got leftovers, I'll just keep it to the next day. And some people did that, and they found out that the next day it was full of worms. Well, on the sixth day, God instructed the people to gather enough for two days. He didn't want any work to be done on the seventh. And so the opposite would happen, Rod. On the sixth day, they could keep enough for the next day. And when they got up the next day, they would find out that it wasn't wormy. It hadn't gone bad. God had made provision. And I just find it so mm. fascinating when you look at this. We talk about God's provision. When we go outside of what God tells us to do, we fail to enjoy the blessing of God's provision. Absolutely we think, true. We think we're the smart ones, that we have the better idea and the better plan. Some people, when they kept for two days, they thought, now I'll just gather for one because I'm going to collect the next day. When they went out on the Sabbath, zero food was available. Mm, that's interesting. They were hungry. That is great. Okay, well, here is Call to Prayer today. Some of the leading examples of God's supply are what we eat and how we live. God is the supplier of our food and of those things we need to live. But there are many in our culture who believe they do not need Him. They've decided that God is not necessary for their existence. Still, others believe in God, even though they act as if He doesn't matter. They actually love religion and its precepts better. Man's inventions come because of God's intercession. God gives us the ability to think, to breathe, and exist, and our minds are motivated by the divine presence of God of the Bible. We would do well to remember how real He is. As we conclude the program, I want to tell you about somebody who is very special and who has sponsored this program, and he has made a way for you and for me to go to heaven. That is Jesus Christ, and he came 2,000 years ago, and he lived a perfect life. The truth is he was crucified, and then he rose again on his own, seen by over 500 people, ascended to heaven, and he said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today.